that just writing an SD as such is not enough to specify the solution. Um, the way we got there was we said, okay, the way to write this SDE is in this integral form. And then we said, okay, with this term here, we know how to do that. Although my z, you see my z is now a random variable because it's driven by this noise here. But it can only be as worse in terms of, uh, uh, of its smoothness as dw here. So this is a continuous function. So we can use our normal Riemann integration to define this integral here. However, here, since the sum or the, the integral of... of, of um, the increment is unbounded. Oh, well, yeah, let's, let's write it as sum. This one is un, uh, uh, unbounded. We have a problem in here, and we have to specify how we, um, how we define this integral. And we said, okay, let's start by defining an integral where we let the partition, if this is time, and we have a tk minus 1, a tk, and here we have some delta t, and k, we want to go up to some kind of time t, so k dt is t, this is our partition, <coughs> and then uh, we say, okay, Let's take d w t k minus w t k minus 1. So this is our dws. And now evaluate our function sigma, I write it now sigma of s, somewhere in the middle here. So at some kind of tau k here. And we said if we do it at the left, most point here, then this was called the Ito integral. Okay. And when we did that, because now the solution only knows, there's all the information about the noise from here. So all the dw's from here, and you learn that dw's of non overlapping time intervals are independent. So that means the expectation value of this is zero. That's a nice property of the Ito integral. However, we paid for it, we said, by having, if we just do a normal integral, ws, dws, that this is not what we expect from a classical calculus, but there's a special additional term there. So in the tutorial, I can go over how to derive this, uh, this formula, if you like. Um, and then we had the other possibility was we evaluated this at the midpoint, which we expressed as an average over the two endpoints here that we have. And that was the Stratonovich um, interpretation. And then <coughs> we have classical calculus does work. But of course now, as soon as you move the, uh, the point where you want to evaluate here, as soon as you move it inside the interval, you create correlations. Okay. So the only one that doesn't give you correlations where each, you know you calculate up to time t and then bam completely new noise and independent of of uh, of the solution flow is the Ito one. Okay. Okay. So um, that was just a very quick recap of what we did earlier on. Um, now I want to look at what's called how, or how this classical calculus gets changed in this Ito formalism. Okay. So. We're going to look at something that's called the Ito formula. And this is in some sense nothing else but the chain rule. So again, the chain rule, but in a different context. So let's say we have an SDE dxt. And that is, we just write it as h of xt t dt plus some sig of xt, could depend on t, dwt. And let's say we have a function or stock 
stochastic process. Why? So yt, that is now a function of xt. Okay. And let's assume that f is differentiable in the x component, okay? at least twice. So the question is, what is dy? Okay. What equation does dy satisfy? Okay. So let's assume for now that x is one dimensional. So what is dy? Well, dy is f of x plus dx, t plus dt, minus f of x, t. Right? So now we can use Taylor expansion here to see what's dy. Okay. So let's do that. So we get, this is partial derivative with respect to t, dt. So this is f. I'm going to write subscript t now. This is confusing here. You subscript t to denote the stochastic process. Here I'm going to use subscript t now to denote the partial derivative with respect to t or you know, subscript x, partial derivative with respect to x. Um, so this is ft dt plus, and now here, yeah, could be on t. So now we have plot. Now, chain rule, f with respect to x, dx. Okay. And now we would stop. Right? In classical calculus, that's where we stop. Okay, that's our chain rule. That's what we used before, you know, for the generator. So that's the chain rule, that's where we know that's where we stop. But you see dx. That's dt, that's why we normally stop. Then we are, are correct up to order dt, and then we can have a dy dt is something well defined. But now we have a dw here. Okay? So dw is is is, is the noise uh, term. <coughs> but we can also for the next order here, so here we get a noise term through that, right? But what would happen at the next order? At the next order we would get a dx squared. A dx squared gets us your wt squared. Wt squared is order t, order delta t. So we have to take the next order here. Because we have, so this would be plus one half, two derivatives with respect to x now, and then a dx squared. Okay, and we subtract the already subtracted the the uh, zero order term here. Okay, so now we can just bang in our expression for dx and see what we get out. So let's first take all the order delta t terms. So we got one here. From here we get another order delta t term that comes from the h. So we get plus f x. Uh, what do we have? H fx, and from here we get one, because if we take delta x squared, well, we get if we square this one, we get an order delta t squared. That's too small for us. We just do a linear approximation here. We get a delta t delta d, uh, d, uh, dw, that's order 3 over 2, okay, it's too high, but we get this one squared, and that gives us a dw squared, which is a dt. So we get plus 1 half sigma squared, on our second derivative, dt, well, and we get one dw term here through the fx dx, because there's, this, there's a fx sigma x dw. Okay. So this is the chain rule here for stochastic processes where we have to include the next next order here because we get, we get another DT, uh, order dt term here. So if we do this in multi dimensions, so 
So now x is in some, or I call it capital X, is in some Rn. Well, then we get the same. So x is in Rn. So h is in Rn. And now the sigma <coughs> could be a matrix. So that should be n cross m. And then our dw could be m-dimensional Brownian motion. Okay. So this is now a multi-dimensional SDE. And then what do we get? We get dy is again ft dt plus now the gradient of f dx transposed okay. plus the second order term we know we need it. So we would get a dx transposed and now I use Jean-Luc's notation here. Um, not quite, this is a matrix here, so Jean-Luc used it as a, just uh, to describe blah, blah, but this is a matrix, so be careful. Uh, dx, and now, <coughs> again, we order, in terms of what's order delta t and what's uh, a dw term. So, this is an order delta t term. Here we get an order delta t coming from the h. So plus h dot grad f, which is order delta t. And here we get an order delta t from the dw's. Okay? So plus, well, actually, let me just write it like this. Plus one half uh, yeah, I'll treat that one differently. Plus, <coughs> we have um, the noise term. So gradient f transposed now, a transpose at times uh, sigma dwt. And now let, let's deal with this one now. So this is one half. And I'm going to do this now in suffix notation, because otherwise I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes anyway. but. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I use suffix notation for now. So let's start with the with the, uh, 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 matrix C, uh, uh, the matrix here. So this is the matrix D, X, I, delta, X, J on F. Okay. Now we have a delta a DX coming from here. So that would be, if this is a J, that would be a sigma J, K, D, W, K. Okay, so I use Einstein summation convention. So k we sum k from one to m, because our sigma or dw was an m-dimensional Brownian motion. Okay, so now we do the same thing uh, coming from here. So this would be a sigma. Now I, and then call it L. Dwl. Okay. So now we got a DWL and a DWK. So we only get an order delta T if K is equal to L. Okay? Otherwise, we get these two Brownian motion uh, kind of, I mean, non overlapping intervals here. Okay? So K is equal to L. That means this one should be one half sigma i. K, D, W, K, delta X, I, delta X, J on F, sigma J, K, D, W, K. So the D, W, K, D, W, K is going to be my delta T, my DT. And this one, I can now write, I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce some notation here. So I'm going to introduce a notation for how a divergence operator acts on a matrix. Okay. So, divergence operator acting on a matrix. So, let's say A, then I say what I mean by the ice component of this is a D. Uh, I notice this. Um, is D 
dx i a i j. Didn't write that down here. Okay. So, um, and now I can re let me write this down. Uh, what this becomes. So this is one half, and now I call it sigma, capital sigma, and I introduce an inner product here uh, uh, for matrices on F dt. So I'm also going to use, if I have two matrices A, B, then the inner product, this is J, sorry. Um, so the inner product uh, A and B, um, I'm say is A, I, J, B, I, J. So it's a trace of A transpose B. Um, so sigma here is sigma transposed sigma, our small ones. Okay. Sorry, sigma, sigma transpose that one. Okay, so you can verify this is, this is now, you see sigma jk is sigma k j transposed. Right? So what we have here is sigma, sigma transposed, that's my capital sigma, and then I got an i k and here I got the I, uh, um, uh, sorry, I got the, I sum over, that's right, I sum over the K. So now I got an IJ, C, capital sigma IJ, and that gets component wise summed up with the delta XI, delta XJ coming from here. So let me just write this down one more time. So FT plus H dot grad F plus one half sigma matrix in a product. It's my matrix nabla nabla f. This is dt. And then we have plus our gradient f dot sigma dwt. So this is in multi dimensions. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to reiterate now what I said before about when to use these um, different interpretations um, of the noise. Um, before I want to discuss a particular stochastic process, which is called the Einstein-Uhlenbeck process, that we will encounter a lot later on and that we use sort of as a tool to model noise. But first of all, the question, which interpretation of the noise should we use? So the first remark on this is, once you decided on one interpretation, you can always morph into another one. Okay, And so, for example, so let me just say, so you can transform, and I'm, I'm just going to state that here. Let's assume you have an e to uh, um, um, SDE. Actually, let's assume we have Stratonovich. So for Stratonovich, if you mean Stratonovich, you usually write a little circle here. So S circle DW. So that indicates to the reader, aha, the person writing this means they interpret this noise in the Stratonovich sense. Um, so we know where they, inter uh, where they evaluate the integral. And more importantly, what you know is classical calculus works. Okay. But this is equivalent to, you can transform this into the following Eto SDE, where you have f of xt dt, and now you change The drift term is 
And you add this drift term here. Okay? So you can transform. The solutions obviously will be different because here, here, here you have a different, different vector field, right? Uh, the, uh, so the different drift coefficient. So we get a different solution if you put it on a computer than just ignoring this term. Okay? But you can, if you know this term here for Ito, you can find the equivalent formulation in the Stratonovich um, case. But what I would like to say, so this is handy to know, but there's still, of course, a difference between the two. So I want to reiterate this, that if you look, which is what we later want to do, if we look at the stochastic diffusive limit of a deterministic chaotic system, multi-scale system, so where classical calculus works, and you look for the limit, you expect or you want that in the limit, classical calculus will also work, right? If you use that procedure of classical calculus all the way through to your limit, so the limit will also obey classical calculus. And that tells you, if you're looking at these limits of where you approximate something rough, which is Brownian motion, by something smooth, which is a chaotic uh, dynamical system, you expect and you get Stratonovich interpretation noise. Okay. And that has a fancy name, which is called the Wong, not Wong Zakai theorem. So that says the following. So consider a sequence W epsilon, N, uh, the epsilon T. And these are now f sequence of functions that are smooth. Okay. Of smooth functions. And let's say that the limit of these smooth functions is Brownian motion, which is continuous but not differentiable. Okay. Then what you can prove is that the solution of the smooth system d x t epsilon, so this is epsilon going to zero here, so epsilon is some parameter of your, of your sequence, is f, so the solution of this of this now smooth, let's say, deterministic system, converges, and this is actually almost surely, that's not what we will later be able to prove, but um, this is what Wang Zakai can prove, and they have, they look at, well, they actually look at stochastic systems in the uh, original paper. Um, to solutions that I'm going to call dxt of f of xt dt plus sigma of this limiting process xt and now dt. So this is a limiting process where we let epsilon going to zero and now we have the Stratonovich interpretation of the noise. Okay. And given this, we can write this in Ito form. Okay. But if we want to use the f, just saying, okay, now my f of x epsilon converges to f of x, and this converges to this. Okay. So that's a very powerful theorem that gives you some kind of hint of why it matters what you take as the approximation. Okay. Because it's a classical calculus that works for those smooth functions. WT epsilon, and if you want to approximate it, them like the limiting process with something rough, which is our, our uh, Brownian motion, then you need Stratonovich. Okay, so one more bit of sort of tedious work is looking at a particular case of um, an SDE, and after that we can start doing our model reduction. Okay, so I want to look at a particular stochastic process, that's called an einstein uhlenbeck process. And an einstein uhlenbeck process 
is a process where you have the following three, um, three properties. You want it to be Gaussian, you want it to be Markovian, so it only depends on previous time, and you want it to be white sense stationary. Did you discuss that? No. Okay. So we have to define something before that. So a definition, a stochastic, you kind of encountered it in some sense already, I guess. A stochastic process is called white sense stationary if the expectation value exists and is, well, is finite, and if the following object, so the covariance of, if you take xt, you subtract the mean, okay, so these are the deviations of the process at time t from your mean, and you look at how does that correlate with xs minus mu, then this is a function, let's call it v, that only depends on t minus s. Okay? So Brownian motion is not white sense stationary. Try to prove that. Okay? But a process that is Gaussian is Markovian. So that's Brownian motion. Okay, fine. But it's also white sense stationary. So that excludes Brownian motion now. It's called an Ornstein. Uhlenbeck process. So that's just a formal definition. And then there's a theorem by Daub that is very helpful. It says if you have a process that satisfies these three uh, um, um, qualities, then there is a particular SDE that describes that process. So, an OU, short Einstein Uhlenbeck process, satisfies the A, uh, SDE, what's my notation? DXT is minus gamma XT minus mu DT plus sigma DWT. And gamma is strictly non zero. Okay. And dWt here is Brownian motion, okay, with unit variance. Okay, so what does this process mean here? Let's set mu equal to zero for now. So mean is zero. Right before we talked about the drunkard, right here going on here. So if you're really drunk and you have a long way home, you can be anywhere, right? But let's say you're not that drunk. Let's say you kind of, you know, you kind of said at the last class, you said, no, no, thank you, thank you, just don't have that. So you're still drunk. So you go home, but something tells you, no, 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 hold on, there's cars to the left, there's cars to the right, I better go back to, to the mean, right? And you kind of wander off and then, oh, better go back to the mean. So that's what this bit here does. If gamma is positive, you, you're drawn back to the mean, okay? It pushes you back. So if you have a big excursion, you will go back to the mean. So if this DW here, whoop, would go like here, big excursion. Next one, this is a big difference here. So you'll be pushed back to the mean, okay? So this allows you to actually get a nice probability density function, a nice density function for your, uh, for your process with a finite variance, okay? Because you always, the big excursions that you can, that the drunkard that just has Brownian motion can just wander off, that can't happen here. 
Okay. So let's look at some um, some properties of this on-chain Gutenberg process that we will need later on, and then we can just refer to them and use them as we like. So first one can be solved explicitly. All right. You can solve this equation. You can find an integrating factor here, the e to the e to the gamma x t, and solve it. So the solution is x t is well x naught minus mu e to the minus gamma t plus mu plus sigma integral zero to t e to the gamma of s minus t dws. So now, <coughs> since we have the solution, we can calculate moments, autocorrelations, things like that. Okay, so let's, let's do that. Well, it's clearly Gaussian. And if it's Gaussian, that means the only thing, to, the, 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 we can completely characterize the process by just the mean and the variance. Okay, so let's look at the mean. So the mean. You see, this is a deterministic function here. So that's just the number. So the mean of this whole thing, we, is, is the mean of this integral is zero, because the mean of each of those increments is zero. So we're left with this first bit here. Okay. So let's look at the variance. So this would be xt minus expectation value of xt squared. And what is that? So we subtract this bit, that's the mean, and square it. So we get the expectation value. So expectation value is with respect to Brownian motion driving pass. So it's an expectation value of sigma 0 to t e to the gamma of s minus t dash, t dash, no, what am I doing? Of s, let's call it s dash, t s dash, and I have another one, and I let this one go to s, and I now I have e to the gamma, Ui, what am I going to do? Minus t, so this is minus s, and this I call t dash. D T dash. Okay. So now we only get a contribution if those nah if those intervals are overlapping. If they're not overlapping, then we can use the independence of the uh, of non-overlapping integrals to conclude that the expectation value is zero. So the only contribution we get if is if is S dash is equal to T dash. Okay? So this is equal to, and then we know that the expectation value of, of that, of this DW is squared is DT or DS dash. So let's call it, let's call it S. So this is sigma squared. And now we get integral zero to T and we get E to the gamma. So if we look at, um, Gamma, what do I have to do here? Um, right. So I get gamma S minus T, and I get a 2 now, DS. So if I evaluate this, I get a sigma squared over 2 gamma coming from here, and 1 minus E to the minus to gamma t. Okay? So if t goes to infinity, I get constant variance here. Okay? So if t goes to infinity, also the mean goes to constant, and the variance goes to constant. So I have a nice, what I already kind of drew here, 
got a nice Gaussian distribution in the limit. Okay. Um, so, yes? That's right. Mu of t, yeah, it's not a random process, right? That's right, it can be a function of t. Yes. Oh, yes. That's right. Yes, so here I should better write mu of t. Now, this is a different mu to this. Yeah, right? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry? Yes? Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry. You're right. It should be minus T. And this should be T dash. I call this T dash now. But thank you. Yeah, the rest was wrong. Yep. Hope so. Yes, thank you. So this should have been a T up here, right? We integrate from 0 to T, right? That's what we bang in. So this is 0 to T. And so it should be minus t in here and minus t in there. Okay? So this, <coughs> this distribution function here, let's call it p of xt, is now a Gaussian. So if we call this thing here, we, I'm going to give this some kind of names now. I'm going to call this m and I'm going to call this s squared. They depend on t, on time. So this is now a Gaussian. So 2 pi, and now I got my s squared here as my normalization factor, and then the exponential minus x minus m squared over 2 s squared. All right. Oh, one more. So let's look at, so these are the variances. Let's look at autocorrelations. Okay, so if we take the process at time xt, how is, is the expectation value, you know, how is the correlation with x at a time s? So another one we need. So expectation value of xt, xs. Then I hope I've given you enough for the... Oh, no, not yet. Okay. All right. So assume now for simplicity... that the initial condition was zero and that the mean is zero because I don't want to write all these long terms. Okay. So now xt is just sigma zero to t e to the gamma s minus t dws. And let's look at the expectation value xt xs. Okay. So now we got a sigma squared, and we have now the integral from 0 to t, e to the minus gamma t minus t dash, dw t dash, and now an integral going to s, e to the minus gamma s dash minus s, dw s dash. And so now, we have to ask, we have got non-overlapping integrals, 
uh, that, that would give us a zero uh, contribution. So we look again when is t dash equal to s dash. And then we have an integral that can only go up to the minimum of t and s. Okay. So this would be equal to sigma squared integral to the minimum of t and s of e to the minus gamma, and now we got t plus s minus 2 s dash or t dash dw uh, dt dash. Okay? And that we can evaluate to give us sigma squared over 2 gamma e to the minus gamma absolute value t minus s minus sigma squared over 2 gamma e to the minus gamma t plus s. So now you see that if time goes to infinity, well, this one we don't know, right? That can be very large still, because it could be t could be equal to s or close to s. But this one here will go to zero. So if time goes to infinity, you will have now white sense stationary process, because this object here only depends on t minus s. It's only on the difference. There's some stationarity there. It's only the difference in time that matters, not a you are exactly at time. Okay. So, <coughs> for t s going to infinity, this process is white sense stationary. Okay. All right. So now we know a little bit about stochastic calculus and at, uh, SDEs. So let's try now, um, in the last 17 minutes, that should be enough, to develop this three framework or three picture uh, thing that we did before for the ODEs. Okay. So now we have an SDE. Now we want to know how do expectation values propagate in time and how do densities propagate in time now. Um, and so we start again with a possibly nonlinear SDE. And again we use the generator. Oh no, I actually maybe I should have kept this. Let me just rewrite the eta formula. So we had a y, which was f of x, and let's say dx t is h of x t dt plus sigma x t dw t. Then we had dy was, and let's say this on, oh well, let's put the dt here. So f t plus h dot grad, you recognize this already? This was the L before, yes? Yeah? Yes? Yes, in high dimensions, yes. Which is Gaussian, right? That's fine. You can have multi-dimensional. Sorry? No? So S is non-zero, right? If the sigma squared is non-zero, your, your s squared will be non-zero, right? Oh, this is covered in time here, right? You, here you would look at multidimensional x. So it would be that between, let's say this is, so x t is a multidimension, so it would be x component 1t, x component nt. 
So now you would have the covariances between all those elements, right? And that would give you your S squared. Okay? That, that would be a matrix, and that's correct. So you look at all the covariance between all the individual components at time t. At time t. So that's different to this one where you look at two different times. Okay? Thanks. So, this guy here you recognize already as the generator we had. But now, we got plus one half, and now let's call it sigma again. Sorry. F dt plus, what did we get? I can't remember. What was it? Fx, that's right. Fx uh, d, um, sigma dw. I'm, I'm writing it. Oh, no, I should write it, actually. I should write it multidimensional. Okay? So that's, I'm just recalling what we did before. So, now we're going to do the same thing as before. We're using the generator. Um, to relate the SDE picture to the observable picture to the density picture. Okay? So given an SDE uh, dz is h of z dt plus sigma of z dwt, okay? then the corresponding Generator, it, well, this was just a chain rule, right? And oh, we did it before. E2 is nothing else but the chain rule. So the generator, well, we define it as the part, the non noisy part. Okay? And the sigma again is just small sigma, sigma transposed. And Let's show now that this object here, which is just, I mean, here we don't depend, this doesn't depend, like for, for observables, uh, this will not uh, depend on t here. So we will get this as our, uh, our generator, ignoring this part, and that will determine the time evolution of observables. So let's see that. We give the statement first. So let phi of z going well, going from z to r be again an L1 observable, so integral observable. And now we consider the expectation value. So v of z t, which is the expectation value where this expectation value is over the Brownian motion pass of phi of z of t, given that at zero, we started as at some z. Okay? So this is a true expectation value now, where we average over Brownian motion driving paths. Okay? There's no initial conditions here anymore, right? We always start at the same initial condition, but now the average is taken over Brownian motion driving paths. Okay? Now we have a truly stochastic system. So then, <coughs> w, uh, V of Z T satisfies the same Cauchy problem as before, but now L is given by this formula here. Okay? In the deterministic case, it was just this. Okay? So if sigma is zero, of course, we would like to recover the deterministic case. So, well, now we have a problem, though. Remember before we used the kind of the inverse map of the flow map. We can't do that anymore. Yeah. Okay, we can't just go back. So, um, where was the group person before? Now we actually have to think of semigroups, inverses of these operators that we're going to discuss don't exist anymore. 
Okay. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we use Ito. We know somehow the L is the chain rule, so let's use Ito formula. So the proof is to use Ito. So we consider now as our stochastic process yt is phi of z of t. Okay. Z of t is a stochast is stochastic. Phi of t is now a random right, stochastic process. And y of t is then a stochastic process, right? So what's the SDE for y of t? So let's call, so we have d phi of zt. Well, let's chain rule, we know this. So this is e to formula. So I write e now as l phi dt plus we have this bit here, grad phi transpose sigma dwt. Just chain rule using Ito, right? Chain rule plus this additional term. And I call this bit here L. And phi doesn't depend explicitly on t. Only through z of t. So this term here we don't need. Okay? All right, well... We need V, we need the expectation. So let's take the expectation of this. Okay? So what we get is D of the expectation of phi of ZT, well that's V of ZT. So that's D V. This is L expectation of phi is V DT. Expectation of this zero. Right? We take over the Brownian motion uh, driving path, so expectation of this is zero. So what do we get from here? Well, V is a function of, uh, uh, um, of, of uh, Z and T. So D, this DV DT is now partial DV DT. Because this is now, this is, these are initial conditions. They're not, they don't depend on time. These are independent variables. So this is equal to dv dt. So what we end up with is exactly this equation here. And this equation is called the backward Kolmogorov equation. Okay, so now we have an equation that for an SDE tells us if we take observ observables for an SDE and we look at all those different driving paths, right, of all these different realizations of our Brownian motion, look at them at some time t, we evaluate all those outputs from our observation and average, and these averages are propagated by e to the lt. Okay? Look at this. It's actually very easy to see in here, in this picture. Okay? So you see, you've got an E to the LT now of phi of that, and that is your V. Okay? So the L has now time derivative. Okay? So the equation, like the VT, is some kind of blah, blah, H, VX, right? Or whatever, it's H twiddle VX. Plus sigma twiddle vxx. So you got a diffusion equation. You can't let time go to infinity, right? If, if you blow up if you go backwards in time. So the diffusion screws it up, the inverse here. Because okay? you can't go backwards in time, you will, you, you will blow up. Okay? Because you have this diffusion here. Okay? So it's easier to see actually in here. You don't need to think about Brownian motion and, and things like that. You just look at a PDE and how whether you can go backward. I mean, this PDE is not nice. Right? 
Okay. So what about the um, what about the other um, the other picture, the density picture? Okay. So we got our SDE. We have our generator, and now we know how expectation values are propagated. So let's see how densities are propagated. So again, we need to look at the adjoint, the formal L2 adjoint. Um, so we consider the formal L2 adjoint, which is now minus divergence on something wrong here, divergence on rho, and then plus one half. And now we have uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to write it down, and then I'm going to define what I mean by that. So here again, I use my how the divergence acts on a um, uh, uh, on a matrix, and then also so this now here would be delta z i delta z j. Sigma ij rho. Okay. And <coughs> if we have now solutions, well, let's say we have solutions to the SDE, so we've got nice unique solutions, then we have classical solutions here for this Cauchy problem. And then, if that's the case, so if there's something weird, maybe this has to go this way. Um, the solutions to SDE, I just write R nice, so uniqueness and solutions, so first we got the semi-group, then rho, the density, satisfies what's called the Fokker-Planck equation, which has again the same form as before. And again, you see, if sigma is zero, we're back to the case that we discussed in the uh, purely deterministic case. So this is the Fokker-Planck equation. Before the deterministic case, we called it the Liouville equation. And we should be precise here, or slight, well, slightly precise, so Z and T, so Z is out of our space Z, but T now has to be positive. Okay? And that is the same actually for here. Okay? For that reason that we can't go backwards in time now. Okay. So now we have three pictures here. We have the SDE picture, we got the uh, expectation value picture, and we got the density picture. And we can relate them via these generators L and L star. Okay? So this is now um, sort of the end of the background material. And in the next lecture, I'd like to start slowly with deterministic systems and doing model reduction, and then going to stochastic systems and doing model reduction, and then at the end, um, talking about deterministic systems and the diffusive limits, okay? where we use the same methods, formally the same methods as in the, as in the stochastic case. But we start slowly with this program, you know, why relaxes to fixed point, periodic orbit, and then we do some stochastic or ergodic process. Okay? Okay. I think I'll stop here if there's no. You give me 15 seconds. Thank you, it's so generous. I love it. <laughs> Unless there are questions, I'm sure there are. But. That's right. Yes? No. That is the density for the state. Again, this is the density after. 
that is a Brownian motion here. That's important. So how would we evaluate this? So let's do the picture again. Let we start here. Sorry, yes? Yeah? Yes? That's right. That's right. So if we fix that node, absolutely. That's right, yes. But then after that, the noise will. That. That's right. Yeah, you could you could have an initial uncertainty in your uh, right. You could have. So what you, I mean, what the density in some sense is like. You start here. You take one realization and you get this, right? You take another one. Let's say the mean is roughly here. You take another one. You take this and so forth. So now you want to know the density at one point t, point in time t. So you kind of check how many points are close to here, and you would get sort of some kind of histogram, right? You kind of now calculate how many points or measure how many points of your simulations go into a certain bin, and then you can draw a histogram, and that will converge to this. I mean, that's how you have to think of this density here, right? That we're now talking about. Sorry? Yes, this? No, this is, this is just my placeholder for the initial, con initial density. So if they all start here, then O naught of Z would be delta of Z minus Z naught. Okay. So and if we have an ergodic process, and the uh, OU process is ergodic, in the end, you will converge to something Gaussian, independent of what you put in. So you forget, I mean, the, the idea there about ergodicity is you, you kind of forget where you came from. It doesn't matter whether you start here, 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 or anywhere. In the end, all this, you know, the, the density will converge to the same unique function. So no matter what you start with, so you, you, you lose memory. You lose memory of where, where you came from, your initial conditions. You lose memory about, uh, about your initial conditions. Hungry, Jean-Luc? Are you hungry? Okay. 